Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I am your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Unidose Multimedia, and I'd like to welcome Joe Garcia to the program. Hey, Joe, how are you doing? Doing great. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Now, um, typically I start with your mission statement, but I'm going to hold off on that for a second. And I want to like dive a little bit more into Joe and Joe's past. Sure. If that's okay. So tell me about sales, Joe. You seem like you were big into sales. Well, yeah, that that's, uh, um, yeah, that's my, my background, I guess, more of my professional background. I was in, uh, in sales management, um, in, uh, the telecom, uh, industry for quite some time. I started out, as they say, carrying a bag, being a salesman, and working my way into um, into uh, sales management, then uh, like a sales director for a region of uh, for a telecommunications company called uh, Avaya. Well, different names. Um, well, that still happens today. You know, uh, businesses being acquired. So. Spin off companies from AT&T, let's just say. AT&T, Lucent Technologies, uh, and then Avaya. Um, it's interesting. I've had, I worked for these different companies, but I had uh, my same desk and I was in the same office and my same phone number. <laughs> but uh, um, loved it uh, and love everything about uh, sales and sales management. Yes. So what was, uh, what was your particular strength? You know, um, I would say is a good listener establishing trust and being upfront on whether or not I was really going to be able to help somebody um, because you're 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 not it for everybody. And um, if you're upfront with that, um, it's 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 very valuable to everyone. It's it, it's respectful to the client with their own time um, to help them meet their own um you know, uh, initiatives with the interaction that they were going to have with you. Um, because if you're not the right fit, you're not the right fit. They should search to find the right one. On my end, it was respectful for my own time and, you know, not trying to force a, a square peg in a round hole. You know, your your industry, your products, you know, they serve certain functions and and they are better for some businesses than others, depending on what the need is. Um my niche was that I was very successful with companies that made money on the phone. Um, so these, what they would call call centers, uh, uh, in those environments, you know, the, the value proposition that we demonstrated was of great value. And I helped businesses make more money in that, in that fashion. If some of their drivers were other areas within telecom that were still quite uh, important, they may or may not have been stronger fit. And how long do you, how long were you in these positions? About 17 years. 17 years. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I'm older than I look. (laughs) So you start at age 10. Yeah, there you go. Selling phone, 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 phone systems. And so. Yeah, um, Yeah, phone systems and data networks. But yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So how do you go from that 17 years in a, in that realm to shifting to executive director at Crystal Ray? What is the what is the journey there? How did that What's what's the logical path? Yeah, where, where, where is where is this starting, you know, where does this collide? Well, what ends up happening is this, the industry that I was in, in, in telecommunications there and data networks, back in, in the day, it was very much uh, a consultative type of a relationship. So we were, we, you know, we were experts in the field and we helped guided uh, to guide a business uh, into success based on, um, you know, what their end goals were and our deliverables. Over time, our industry, our equipment, um, 
and I hate to say this, but it, it moved towards um, less requiring the the consultative uh, approach. It, it, it moved its way into more of a commodity. It's not a total commodity now where you can just buy everything online, but much of the expertise now um, is quite straightforward. So, and that's what I liked about what I did in, in that type of sales is I liked to be uh, the consultant. I like to to lend my level of expertise into that business. And when I, as those opportunities were changing, to stay in the field, I had to, let's say, broaden my reach. So instead of, of managing sales teams that were, let's say, all concentrated in Michigan, then it moved into the Midwest, and then it moved into the east side of the country. And, you know, 20-year-olds love the idea of getting on a plane on Monday and coming back on Friday. I don't. And so I knew I had to logically move. And with that, it was just trying to discover um, what those, uh, what that new, um, what that new meaningful work relationship would be for me. So there was, there was some in-between stuff, as they say. Uh, I worked at MSU, at Michigan State University. Um, for the business school, and I ran their um, MBA career services uh, division there. So I helped MBAs land jobs, and I maintained um, relationships with hiring companies. So that was like my first transition because I, I, I got to um, have, uh, let's say, relationships with businesses, which I like to do in this particular role. And I like to mentor people with the students, you know, trying to, you know, uh, present their best foot forward as they were looking to get back into the marketplace after going through university, uh, Michigan State University's um, uh, MBA program. Um, later on from there, well, I discovered there was some things about that work that I really liked and some things that I didn't care so much. So I knew it was good, but I knew it wasn't um, my end all yet. I took a I, I took a stint in becoming a small business owner, and I, I um, moved into a passion that I had, which was fitness. And I operated uh, three gym facilities: one in South Lansing and two in the Kalamazoo area. Um, and I was doing that quite happily when this opportunity came to help a nonprofit. And and that nonprofit was Cristo Rey Community Center which uh, I had previous involvement with, um, which the investigating of how I could help rekindled a, a passion that I had for you know, helping people in need, helping people who, who followed a path of my parents who were first generation Americans. And, and I guess from there, uh, <laughs> that, uh, and that's how it all began. And I just never left it, sold my gym businesses and now I've been back in the, uh, I've been in this nonprofit space for oh, getting close to 11 years. How was that transition? Needed. I'll say it that way. It was needed. The transition was needed to do the work that I'm doing today because I use what I've learned out of consultative sales, of working with Fortune 100 companies, um, working with, uh, with uh, IT infrastructures. Um, I needed that. I needed the what I learned from working at MSU with you know how to how to uh, work in that in that uh, um, that uh, environment of that can be quite bureaucratical, that can be um, um, just challenging in navigating in um, the, uh, the the university uh, setting. Um, and what I learned from running a nonprofit, the simplicities, the streamlining of business, the managing cash flow, I needed all those experiences to do my current work that I love well, because I utilize these various skill sets all the time. And so was there, I mean, you got the job, but was there any, any type of, uh, discussion around the fact that you didn't have experience in the nonprofit world? Was there any type of like pushback on that? Well, I would think that the position that Cristo Rey was at the time is they needed a capable leader. 
Um, and maybe they would have loved someone who had had that nonprofit experience and whatnot. They weren't in the position to attract that person. Um, you know, I didn't need the money at the time. So certainly they weren't offering anything that was going to attract someone that probably could do the job well already. I happened to love the mission and could relate to the population that they were serving. So it was more of a, it was more of a mission of love for me to be involved in it. And as I've shared with you in the past, I think in private conversations, you know, my real motivation to be involved was to help close it with some dignity, to, to apply what I've learned in my own MBA program, uh, to put it to use here and finding the healthy pieces of the current nonprofit and, you know, setting them up in a standalone environment where they can succeed. The pieces that needed help, plug them into a complementary agency within the community that could see it through. So in this case, uh, connecting the medical practice with the health department. Um, it would be our food operations that we were running here at Christ Array, you know, find a way to navigate and work with Salvation Army, for instance, and plug them in there. Um, and counseling services at the time was a very sustainable, was the only sustainable operation at Christ Array. I felt that that, you know, find the smaller building in a easy access location and that could survive on its own. And then I'd go back and I would do, I would go back to my gyms and that work that I loved. But what happened through that process was um, I was reminded, uh, I remembered again, bad English here, so, sorry about that, but I was reminded of of the importance of this little building on 1717 North High Street had for people. And um, and what a loss it would be if it didn't exist uh, in the manner that it was operating. So, you know, then I, I turned everything around. I changed my mind. It was like, uh, instead of working on how to dismantle and, and repurpose, it was how do we make this work? Um, but, uh, so I, I don't know that I answered your question very well. I think they took a chance <laughs> on me because they didn't have much of a choice. I certainly knew I was very capable. I certainly feel that they understood that my background um, uh, lent itself to at least being able to bring in some new approaches because the approaches of the at least not so distant past were not working. So how long did you, what did it take for you to, to, from when you started to when you hit that revelation that, okay, this, I, I have to be in this position going forward. How, yeah, how long that, did didn't, I, that didn't take very long. That took about, <laughs> uh, that took a couple months to realize that I can't let this go. So, but then I will say that it probably took a good year and a half to, before I could lift my head up to look past what was in front of me to make it sustainable. Because this is a, uh, an agency that was doing great work, but was losing money every day and didn't have any reserve. So it was, it was dollar creation every day, maintaining the services that we have every day, demonstrating a value to the community to say that we are worth investing in. Um, so, you know, much of that, so much of that was just, you know, committing everything to it again, not, not even without any real opportunity to look up. Cause that's what it was neat. That that's what was needed at the time. Right. So let's, let's look at the first five years. You said they've been there for about 11 years. Uh -huh. that, that first five years, what were some of the things that you went forward and implemented that, that worked? Well, some of the things I did is I, I looked at all our grants, all our contracts, um, be it with, uh, with, uh, um, with state agencies, local agencies, you know, even the, uh, the agreement of the, of the source that, uh, that cleaned our building and I renegotiated everything, you know, looked at trying to create some fair, uh, terms, uh, which in a lot of cases, weren't you know we we weren't in very fair arrangements 
I had some agreements uh, and no fault with of these other agencies because you know no one no one forced Cristo Ray to take on these agreements. I just don't think that enough diligence were placed in them. Um, uh, certain arrangements that we had, funding sources, it was one of these things where it cost us money to maintain the program. So it might look good to take on a grant that that represents a million dollars, but if it costs you a million one hundred and seventy-five thousand to actually run it, then you know you're better off at least trying to renegotiate it so that you can maintain that one hundred and seventy-five thousand and put it to other to, be, to better uses. So there was a lot of restructuring from that standpoint, a lot of policy and procedural changes. You know, taking a look at you know, how we operated, how we made decisions. And um, and a lot of really um, straightforward conversations with the team at the time. You know, I had many a conversation where, where I, what I call them as conversations at the door. So it's like, uh, picture yourself, open up your door and stand in that little archway where it opens and, and you're, you're having a conversation right there. And the questions that you're asking is, what side of the door do you belong on? Belong on side the door that we're going to roll up our sleeves and make something happen? Or is it the side that it's time to now leave and focus your energies in other places? Because I was forced to, you know, I had to work with committed people. And I think at that time is that uh, people, you know, were complacent and, um, you know, lost desire for the mission and, you um, gosh, you don't work in a nonprofit unless you're committed to the mission because we're not the best payers. We're not the best in a lot of different things. Incredible high reward, um, but uh, that, you know, again. So a lot of things like that, which are pretty basic, but sometimes they're hard to do. Um, you know, I think what helped to me staying so focused on it is that I had no other choice but to do those things. It's easy to do the right thing when that's the only choice you have is to do the right thing. But I would say that I spent my first first couple of years exact exactly doing that. It was probably yeah, well into two years in before I really started to become more external, because it's like my my mindset was is I need some I need I need to be able to show the community, what we're doing, the good work that we're doing, and they need to be able to demonstrate it in a way that's going to be positive. And so there was a lot of things I needed to take care of internally to be able to be that agency that uh, people want to partner with, to be that, um, to be that uh, nonprofit that people want to do their philanthropy through us, you know, so, but yeah, so that's how I spent a good part of the uh, of, of the years. And then ov over time, it's becoming more external, um, partnering with other nonprofits, um, making sure that we're we're complementing each other, um, working together. And, you know, and now certainly, you know, um, I'm I'm very well connected with a lot of the other nonprofit leaders in the community. And, you know, to do our best to work together, you know, to help the needs of the of, of people that are, you know, the poor and the vulnerable and these special circumstances that uh, that require our help. Before I ask the next question, I'd be remiss to not do what I normally do with this podcast and ask, what is the mission of Cristo Ray? <clears throat> well, and I'm going to even simplify it. OK, because sometimes missions get a little bit long. You know, <laughs> we're, we're here to meet people where they're at, to help in any way that we can without any expectation. So our efforts, I don't know if what we're going to do is helping them somebody for a day, for a week, or if it will change their lives. It doesn't matter. It's meeting people where they're at, helping them uh, uh, in any way that we can, treating everyone with dignity. Everyone deserves that. Everyone deserves to be treated with dignity. Uh, with care and with compassion and with love. Nice. So you're five, six years in or so, and uh, all these relationships that you've built with other nonprofits, making these partnerships, you know, solidifying the services and, and the outreach into the community. 
we get hit with a pandemic. And so how did you have, how did you uh, weather that storm through all the things that you put in place? You know, um, <laughs> as best we could, you know, basically got on my printer and uh, created little, uh, little ID cards that said we were essential workers because we were because the poor and the vulnerable still need to be fed. They need medical care. Uh, people who are struggling with their addictions need a path to be able to follow. We weren't uh, about, okay, well, I need to take a day off. I can't do the things that we did anymore. Uh, everyone's going to work from home. That just wasn't it. So we did do things differently. So unfortunately, the, me the like our meal service, for instance, it was all to-go meals. Um, initially with the pandemic and the pandemic requirements, you know, we were doing, we were doing medical appointments, um, you know, curbside, <laughs> you know, or, or having a, pri a provider walk up to an individual's car. We had little prop up tents in the back of our, of our medical practice so we could have open air appointments. Uh, we did what we could and we utilized Zoom when we could as well, of course. But um, we adapted. We did food orders where we met the person at the door, had a conversation with them with likes and dislikes about the different food items, and we'd go back and fill an order and then bring a grocery cart out of food to them. But, you know, the minimal face-to-face -face interaction because of all the different requirements that were there. So we never really, um, we never really skipped a beat in how we were, in what we did, how we did it change but um, the outputs were still the same. That's incredible. Um, yeah, I remember, you know, talking with you about, actually, what, let's, let's go back to one of the partnerships that you, you made during that time with the uh, Greater Lansing Food Bank. Sure. Um, yeah, let's, because uh, we, uh, you were actually in the first season of this podcast, uh, three years back with, okay. with Michelle Lance um, talking about this specifically about the collaborative aspects of nonprofits uh, in the area. And so talk about that program again uh, and then how, how that's gone since. Well, sure. That, that initiative was, was like this. Um, the St. Vincent Catholic Charities is a, is a refugee resettlement agency for our, our Lansing area. And around that time, there was still the, the COVID environment period, I think tail end of that. Uh, there was different challenges there, but what was happening is that there wasn't enough housing available for these refugee families to, to be settled in a home. So what, what they were forced to do, they, the refugee services uh, program, they had to house folks in uh, in hotels or in a single hotel, and um, the hotel didn't allow the the access to their kitchen, for instance, to do prepared meals. In a hotel room, you know, has a microwave at best in there and maybe a mini fridge. So for a family, they really can't cook for themselves. Um, any, you know, they can't really do anything but maybe heat things up. So the food bank was trying to find ways to help provide some food for these individuals and um and uh like um sorry about that live uh live podcast here i have a call coming in that i just had to send away but at <laughs> any rate um michelle wanted to help because a refugees program was struggling on how to meet this need and she said if this was like a thursday hey joe we need to feed these families we need to prep some meals and feed these families, you know, can you help? You know, and it was, yeah, I can help. I don't know how we're going to do it, but I can help. So it was access to our kitchen. I had to rustle up some volunteers. And uh, so Michelle, through the Greater Lansing Food Bank, provided food. And I provided our kitchen and some volunteers uh, to, to prepare meals during the week. Greater Lansing Food Bank tapped their volunteer base to provide volunteers on the weekends to prepare food. And we provided um, lunch and dinner 
to these families that uh, family size changed over time from on the low side 40 to the high side 120. So we provided those two meals a day, uh, seven days a week for six months. And it was a great collaboration with, uh, like I said, started uh, informed on a Thursday, started on a Monday, uh, and we worked for six months. And oftentimes that's how we have to work. We don't, you know, it's like taking the next step before the brick is laid. Just have to do it, have to have a little faith and you have to move forward. But uh, good collaboration made that happen. And uh, yeah, it was a great collaboration. And you actually, we're going to segue into something you just brought up which is St. Vincent Catholic Charities. You have now taken uh, kind of more of a leadership role there. Mm -hmm. And how did that all come about? I, it was probably a little bit more linear than I think. Sure. Well, you know, the, 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 need, the need to bring the two agencies together, there was uh, various situations that, that, that lent itself to the time is now to bring the two charities together. Two Catholic charities within the city of Lansing Operationally, it makes sense to to uh, minimize duplication. You know the the um, the operating expenses, uh, keeping them in check by you know a singular financial department, singular development department, singular HR department. So those that logic certainly had always been there. Some certain circumstances drove that need to to do it now. Um, on the Cristo Rey side, I'll just say because I'm also looking at time is that we had a strong desire to expand our medical operation and move into dental, but we didn't have the space to do it. And if we were to do it on our own campus, it would have, it would have, there would have been a big financial burden to bear there with a, a capital expense for construction. St. Vincent had the available space for us to expand into. And then of course the economies of scale of bringing the two organizations together from a from uh, the infrastructure standpoint, the, the back office standpoint, just made sense. Um, the uh, powers that be at the Diocese of Lansing certainly agreed, and uh, we're moving that along, and for the most part, pretty much done from the legal standpoint. The 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 way we announce it is going to um, is going to take a, a little bit of a challenge on on waiting for all the marketing materials and that to take place, but uh, but uh, um, it's all coming along. It's all come along nicely. That's an, well, I mean, yeah. as we as we close this out, I usually end with one last question because mm -hmm. of the immense amount of effort and time you spend on both of these organizations. What do you do to decompress or take some time and take some time for yourself? Um I walk my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, that's mm -hmm. how I separate my day um, is I walk. Um, I've got a German Shepherd and a pocket beagle. And um, so, you know, I have a busy, crazy day. I get home. The first thing I do is I get their leashes and we go for a walk. That walk is my natural separation from my work to then my home, uh, the rest of the, the home day. And, um, you know, I do a nice two mile loop. So it's enough time to get some exercise, uh, uh, clear the head, and um, and check out. Nice, that is incredible. Well, thanks again, Joe, for taking some time to be on the uh, podcast. And if anybody wanted to reach out to you about in both of the organizations you're 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 a part of, how do they? What, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Well, I guess I would say is that. Uh, is that uh, they certainly can just call the main numbers at uh, Cristo Rey or St. Vincent Catholic Charities and they'll certainly connect them to me. That would be the easiest instead of trying to listen to me to rattle off uh, the, the digits of the, of the numbers. But, you know, we're very well known. Uh, jump on our website. Um, I'm very responsive and I would love to connect. I would love my fellow nonprofits to be as successful as they possibly can because as I overuse this analogy, we are – David's fighting Goliath-sized problems, and darn it, we need to do it together if we're going to be successful. 
Absolutely. Thank you again, Joe. And thank you all for, t- again, taking some time to listen to this program. And don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. And if there's someone you know of that you would like to hear about their nonprofit journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe and YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a review. Thank you again and see you next time in the Control Center.